welcome to worship. There's a song that says, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to clap my hands. I came to stump my feet. I came to leap for joy. I came to shout amen. So make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So let us enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good and worthy to be praised. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Grant us an open heaven. We have gathered together this morning to thank you and to praise you in spirit and in truth. You said how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. We are grateful to be able to worship together with our brothers and sisters, our family, friends, our crew, our tribe, our neighbors, and our community, both near and far. We have been separated from one another and unable to worship together for almost two years. But we are grateful today, God, that you went ahead of us in a pillar of cloud to guide us on our journey during the day and a pillar of fire to give us light so that we could travel safely during the day or night. We thank you, God, for this new day. It's a day that's pregnant with possibilities, filled with miracles, signs, and wonders. We ask now, God, that you would allow us to feel your presence, that you would move by your spirit through this entire service, that you would leave no heart and no stone unturned. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ and your people together say amen. Amen and amen. Good morning, Second Baptist, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year. This Sunday marks the beginning of the season of Advent which is the season that churches all over the world are draped in purple and prepare to celebrate that Jesus is coming. The first Sunday in Advent is the beginning of the liturgical calendar or the church's new year. So as far as the church is concerned, it's a brand new year. But if we're honest, does it really feel brand new when White terrorists can break the law and then use the law to walk away scot-free. It surely doesn't feel brand new. When COVID numbers are growing and people are still spreading misinformation about the vaccine, it feels like old news. When gas prices, food prices, and rent are on the rise while wages are down and good paying jobs are few, these days can feel more like secondhand than brand new. And yet, the theme of the first Sunday in Advent is hope. The renowned poet Langston Hughes wrote a poem titled Hope. In it, he pins, sometimes when I'm lonely, don't know why, keep thinking I won't be lonely by and by. Langston's hope didn't deny the reality of his loneliness, just like the wider arc of his poetry that was written during the Harlem Renaissance didn't deny the overwhelming poverty, joblessness, and oppression that surrounded him. But Langston wrote anyway. Other artists sang anyway, danced anyway, composed anyway. The people lived anyway. Perhaps they wrote and sang and danced their way forward because they had hope. That hope wasn't a dry, false hope rooted in delusion and denial. No, this hope was hard fought and well-worn. It wasn't brand new. This hope was tried and tested in adversity. It was a secondhand kind of hope. This hope looked at broken circumstances and situations in the eye and spoke a secondhand truth that trouble don't last always. 
Where is your hope today? Is it in the fact that some of us were able to have a safe Thanksgiving around tables with our loved ones? Is your hope in remembering that this time last year, we were all struggling through math problems and e-learning, but this year students are back in schools with their teachers and friends? Or maybe your hope is in the first in-person service since March of last year, which we plan to hold next Sunday here at Second Baptist. Where is your hope? Well, wherever your hope is, this Sunday reminds us of the hope that Jesus brings in his presence. He never needed to social distance and he was with us even in the darkest of times this past year. Because of the ever present hope that Jesus brings us, we like Langston can write, sing, dance and live knowing that the broken parts won't always be like this by and by. So happy new year, Second Baptist. And let us continue going forward in worship, celebrating hope together as a community of faith, drawn together in anticipation of the return of the reigning Christ.
Amen. It's prayer time. We invite you wherever you are, whatever you're doing, to just stop, be still, and know that God answers prayers. Whatever you're going through, whatever the situation is, we invite you right now to just turn it over to God and let God have his way. Won't you come and be with us and join with us in prayer this morning? Oh God, in the name of Jesus, we come this morning giving you all the praise, glory, and the honor. God, worthy God, we thank you because we know if it had not been for you on our side, we would be nothing and nowhere. God, as the sun still shines and the seasons continue to change, we are grateful for your loving and saving grace that keeps right on being consistent in our lives. Oh God, have mercy. We thank you for your grace and your mercy during the good and especially the difficult times. We thank you for grace and mercy when we need it the most and when we need it the least. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for just being you. Jesus, we come this morning with something on our hearts and minds. Father, we know you to be a healer, and if there is a healing that's needed, please hear our prayers. God, we know you to be a provider, so we ask that you would hear our prayers and provide in the name of Jesus. God, those of us needing comfort, protection, peace, a way out of no way, a breakthrough, Lord, hear our prayers. God, we ask that you would hear those prayers in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we call on you to hear the prayers of the saints. The saints in Evanston, the saints in Chicago, the saints all over the state, the nation and the world, in the name of Jesus. And when you've heard the saints, we pray that you would open up a window in heaven and pour us out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. Father, we're lifting up our sick and our shut-in in the name of Jesus, as well as our bereaved families. God, give them the strength and determination needed to heal and the comfort to soothe their loss. God, there is nothing, nothing, nothing like losing our loved ones but we are reminded that we serve a God who will be there with us even until the end of time. And so God, we ask that you stir up the energy and the freeing power to heal right now, to deliver, to set free in the name of Jesus. God, we pray for your blessings over us as we have so much to be thankful for. God, you continue to watch us and strengthen us. And Lord, you continue to show us that there are no limits to God's love. We thank you for this season. We thank you in this season. We thank you for all that you have done. God, we pray for a thankful spirit in the assignments and the callings that you have given us over our lives. God, we may want to moan and complain sometimes, but give us a thankful spirit. Remind us of your plans and not our plans. Remind us of your will and not our will. Remind us of your love and your strength and your determination. Remind us that we are your child in the name of Jesus. God, remind us that you are God and not us. So whatever we have decided for ourselves to let go and have your way in our lives, God, when we let go, take over, take control, have your way. God, we thank you. We praise you for today. We praise you for your people. We praise you for your mercy. We praise you, oh God, because we know that you are the living God. God, we know the blood still works. God, in the name of Jesus, we call on that blood. We call on that healing. We call on you, oh God. Whatever it is, God, give it to us. Whatever it is, God, bless us with it. Whatever it is, God, comfort us with this and keep us with it. God, we thank you. We are grateful today for you. Because of you, we still live. Because of you, we are able to run on 
and to see what the end is going to be. And so while we are here on this earth, allow us to be a blessing. While we are here on this earth, allow us to be obedient to your plans and your will, that your will may be done. God, we thank you this morning and we pray the Lord's prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, O God, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, and amen. This past summer for me was marked by the kindness and generosity of strangers. At the end of July, my son Nathan and I spent a week of camping and rock climbing in the Red River Gorge of Kentucky. On the second to last night, we prepared our camp for thunderstorms, but we woke in the middle of the night to find the river rising in our campsite. As we attempted to drive out of camp, the river quickly rose to four feet above the pavement, overtaking our truck and filling the seats with muddy water. As we began to climb out of the windows, I turned to my son who had offered the astute observation, Dad, this is bad. I shared with him this narrow assurance, Nathan, we are going to live through this. And we did live through that night, but we did find ourselves in the coming days faced with new floods of exhaustion, grief, self-doubt, and at times despair. We only made it through each of these coming floods because of the people God had placed in our path. We made it through each of these floods because of the generosity of the search and rescue team, the kindness of a tow truck driver, and the hospitality of fellow climbers, and the superhuman love of my wife who embarked on a 48 hour journey to bring her family home. It doesn't always take heavy rains for us to be overtaken by a flood. Floods of responsibilities, debts, tasks, worries, and doubt. Suddenly there is more than we can handle, control, or even comprehend. As we look at the resources of time, gifts, and money, it does not seem to be enough, but we are able to slow down and take time be kind to those around us and offer what we have to give. God has given you what you need. God is using you to bless those around you. You may be overwhelmed. You may not see the whole story, but God has still given you what you need. And God is using you to bless others in need. In Kentucky, that all volunteer search and rescue team had no way to pull us from the water, but they stayed with us, offering their time through the entire night, shining flashlights from the shore as they waited for the waters to subside. That tow truck driver was short staffed in the midst of the pandemic and his rundown shop was marred by one star Yelp reviews online. But offering kindness, he came at sunrise to pull us from the mud, gave us his gravelly scrapyard to sort our gear and personally drove us to a place to stay the night. And that climber's base camp had lost their own kitchen due to the storm, but offered us the food they had in their staff fridge and a place on their lawn to set up our tents. I'm so grateful that each of these people in the midst of their own floods were willing to take time to care for others offer kindness to strangers, and give what they had to those in need. And I would like to invite each of you this morning to take time, show kindness, and give generously from what you have. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for those around us who have offered what they had in our own times of need. We ask that you would empower us with your spirit to give generously and joyfully, 
trusting that you are able to multiply all that we have to offer as a blessing to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And good morning, Second Baptist and friends. This is truly the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. On this last Sunday in the month of November, you can see that we continue to be creative in bringing the Word of God to you and our praise and worship service. We are grateful for the music ministry and how they have blessed our soul today. And I am especially thankful for our media ministry and the outstanding work that they continue to do. I'm going to be using a, a scripture today that is not an altogether familiar one, but I pray that it will be helpful for each and every one of us in this day and age. Um, it is from Psalm 40, beginning at verse 1. We find these words, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. God lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. God set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. God put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in God. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord God, are the wonders that you have done, the things that you plan for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many, too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burn offerings and sin offerings you did not require. And then I said, here am I. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Let us bow in just a word of prayer. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let our souls look up with a steadfast hope in our wills, be lost in thine. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters of Second Baptist and uh, of the Emerson community and beyond, those who are in our virtual live stream congregation, as the Spirit of the Lord allows, I'd like to preach from the subject as, the, uh, don't you give up on God and God will not give up on you. Really, we could change that around altogether and say, God will not give up on you, and don't you give up on God. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world today, in a world that is filled with men and women, uh, tragically, who have given up. The, tough, the toughness of this world often has a way of making people give up. The meanness and cruelty of the world have a way of making people give up. The betrayal and coldness of friends, sometimes our only family members have a way of making many give up. The shock of youthful eyes witnessing grown-up calamity and crimes, chaos and confusion often have a way of making young people give up. How unquestionably tragic it was, the terrible event that took place in Wisconsin just last week when an SUV drove through a Christmas parade, killing five and wounding others. Just imagine those eyes that saw such human tragedy. Sterile rigidity that is found in ancient doctrines and dogmas, rituals and rites, customs and habits often combine to the degree that make many people give up. Giving up seems to be a sentiment, really a condition, a reaction that is intricately connected to human nature sometimes. I wonder sometimes, are we made to give up? Have we been crafted and created by the majestic and marvelous hand of God to give up? Is there something within our biological framework? Is there a give up gene within the corpus of our life's experiences that makes us give up? Has there been some give up attachment that enters uh, uh, through our education system as we move from childhood into our teen years and then into adulthood. Surely as our eyes um, span the topography of today's landscape, we must admit there are more people who are prone to giving up than there are people who keep their hand to the plow, looking straight forward and never looking back. The statistics are terrible, both for divorce, statistics are terrible for what is happening with African Americans, statistics are terrible with regard to our health and well-being. They are terrible with regard to equity in education. They're terrible with regard to the widening 
wealth gap that exists between whites and blacks in this country, and at this point, the very rich and everybody else. I just believe deeply in my heart that when you look at all of the compelling evidence, there's an indication that many people, because of these residual circumstances, have given up. So many have given up on themselves. They've given up on those who are close to them. They've given up on their families even. They've given up on the community, on the nation. And to a large degree, many have given up on God. Here is the most compelling statistic released by the Gallup poll that specializes in religious surveys in America. The percentage of Americans attending churches has been in a downward spiral for the past 50 years. There were fewer people in churches from 2000 to 2010 than in any other previous 100 years. And from 2010 to 2020, that number even increased. Our population as a nation is growing, but our population as faith communities is dwindling and diminishing. This is hardly more telling than in the African-American community. While there may still be a church building on every other block in many cities, many of these churches have far fewer members, far less support, far smaller resources, and uh, a shorter and smaller influence than just a generation ago. One almost has to ask, when did uh, it ever become popular um, to not follow through, you know, to to, to try to take a shortcut, to, to find a sense of resolve when the goal has not been met, when the battle has not been completed, when the race is not finished? When did it become okay for us as a people, as a city, as a community, as a church, as families, as men and women to look in the mirror and say, that's it, I'm, I'm done, there's nothing more that I want to do. In teaching at seminary, particularly in the summer months, I'm always amazed by students who come to me three or four weeks after the course has begun they want to drop the course. Why do you want to drop the course now? Uh, well, it isn't what I expected. I've fallen behind. I'm too busy. My mom is sick. I lost my dog. The litany of excuses piles up from the floor to the ceiling. I always respond very, very quickly. You should have read the syllabus. You should not have gotten behind. Your schoolwork is the most important thing in your life as a student. Your mom would be ashamed that you're using her as an excuse. Keep looking for your dog after class and you will find your dog. I don't know what the experiences were that the writer of this 40th Psalm had before he sat down one day to pen these words. But I do know that whatever it was, it was not at all a bed of roses and a bowl of cherries. Somewhere within the framework of his daily journey, this writer ran into trouble, ran into problems, ran into a series of situations that, that I'm sure discouraged him where his world may have once been filled with joy and laughter, the world and life had taken him to the brink of tears, where he may have once been able to sing with joy the songs of Zion, to enter into his presence with singing into the Lord's courts with praise. He wound up wounded and broken and a human lump of mess and misery on the ash heap of apathy. If we're not careful, life can do the same for us, particularly as we battle these nascent twins of pandemic in 2021. COVID-19, which seems to be so resilient that it never wants to go away. And of course, the reality of racism, which has never gone away since it's reared its ugly head. See, the first great lesson, it seems to me, of this psalm is one uh, of the greatest lessons in life. First, if you are ready to pledge to not give up on God, you have to begin to master the art of patience. Patience. He teaches us, the psalmist does, that being patient does not mean that you will be free from dealing with the deleterious and uncomfortable situations that often confront you in life. Being patient, waiting for God, does not mean that you will be free from the anguish or the brooding, the confusion, the despair, the evil, the foolishness, the godlessness, the hell, the idiosyncrasies that so predominate our world. Do not ever think that to submit yourself to a posture of, of patience, patiently waiting for the Lord, uh, does not mean that you have to do nothing else. Being patient and waiting for God means that you have the ability at the same time to confront whatever is in front of you, to stand tall and to remain strong. Do not ever think that to submit yourself to patience means that all is going to be quiet on the Western front. 
whether this kind of patience means that you possess a certain kind of uh, understanding that may not be available to other folks around you. This kind of patience teaches those who possess it to turn out distractions and to tune into God, no matter how loud the banter is around you. It allows you to focus with a great sense of great determination on the one who is bringing you the help that you need. Now notice in this first verse that the psalmist tells us that he is patient, but it also tells us why he is patient. The Lord, whatever he's facing, the psalmist, however daunting, however difficult, however personal, or even if it was a national problem, the psalmist has positioned himself to wait on the Lord. He's not waiting for a word from the prophet or high priest. He's not waiting for the general assembly or the armies or the war cry of the soldiers. He's not waiting for the diagnosis and report to come back from the lab. He's not waiting for the doctor to deliver the news, not waiting for the surgeons to explain the delicacy of the procedure or the acuity and precision of their abilities. The psalmist is not, not waiting for his mother, he's not waiting for his father, he's not, not waiting for his loved one. He puts all of these people on the side with a determination like Job. He cries out, out of all my appointed time, I'm going to wait until my change comes. With a courage like Moses, the psalmist cries out, thus says the Lord, let my people go. And with a self-sacrifice like Esther, the psalmist cries, if I perish, then let me perish. I'm going to see the king. And with a conviction like the Hebrews in Babylon who cried out, our God is able to deliver us. But even if he does not deliver us, we will still not bow down to your graven image, O king. And like the example for us all in Jesus who cried out, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. With all of these amazing qualities, the psalmist cries out, but at the same time, waits patiently. And so can you. And so can I. The same amazing power available to them is the same amazing power available to us. They were able to handle whatever the wind blew in their lives, and we are able to handle whatever wind blows in our lives. However the vitriol that is aimed in our direction, we can make it. Whatever the outcome of the verdict and however unjust it is, we can make it, we can handle it if we wait patiently and if we have the ability, you know, to cry out to the Lord. Those folk back then, because of the leadership of the psalmist and the word of God, were able to respond to whatever adversity set itself up in their paths. All you have to do is wait, but you got to wait patiently for the Lord. To wait patiently, as I mentioned, is not an inactive statement. It does not mean we sit on our hands. It does not mean we do uh, that we go into our prayer closet, you know, and refuse to come out. It does not mean we're constricted and confined to our present situation in life. To be patient is not always being quiet. It's not always being impassive. As a people, Second Baptist, we ought to know what kind of patience to exhibit. Those folk um, that are in this world uh, have taught us, who went before us, about the importance of patience also having an active participatory piece to it. An active patience, for instance, found the Baptist preacher Nat Turner, uh, who led an insurrection that let the world know the horror of American slavery, being patient but acting at the same time. An active patience is a Marcus Garvey shouting out above the racism of America in the 1920s, up you mighty race of men and women. An act of patience is Rosa Parks, sitting with Miguel dignity and sacred quietness that, that began the greatest movement our nation has ever known, a movement for civil rights, a movement for social justice and equity for all of God's people. An act of patience means that as you wait and trust in the Lord, you're also actively participating in improving your life and the lives of those who are around you. An act of patience is knowing and believing and trusting that God is going to improve and strengthen not only you, not only your family, not only your neighborhood, but your community, the city of Evanston and the state of Illinois, and ultimately our country and world. But we also have to strive to make our town and our city a better place. We have to strive to make our neighborhood a better place. We have to strive to make our families and ourselves better as well. If you can't do anything more than show love to your neighbor, then show your neighbor some love. If you can't do anything more than share 
a cup of sugar, an egg, a kind word, a helping hand, a shoulder to lean on, then do it as you wait on the advocating premise found in Sam Cooke's song, A Change is inevitably, you know, going to come. Secondly, of course, of course you have to cry. We've mentioned that. We wait patiently and we cry. The richness that is found in the word of God teaches us so many things. It is commendable to have patience. It's amazing to have patience. Patience will carry you much further in life than if you don't have patience. But you must also be able to articulate your crisis unto the Lord. Listen, listen. If you are the victim of a robbery, the first thing you're going to do is call the police. If your child comes home from school with a suspension notice, first thing you're going to do is call the principal. If your cable bill arrives and it is an exorbitant amount, the first thing you're going to do is call the cable company. If you decide to go on vacation, the first thing you're going to do is call a travel agency. If you need a ride to the airport, the first thing you're going to do is call Uber or Lyft or a cab. If you need to go to Paris for a conference, you're going to call the airline. So then why is it when you wake up in the morning, clothed in your right mind, when you realize that you have more than enough food on your table, when the blessings of life keep raining down upon you despite the mitigating circumstances that your life is in. Why is it that we fail to call and cry out to God? My God, God keeps raining, raining, raining blessings down upon us. Blink your eyes about 17,000 times a day without ever once computing a signal to your brain to remind it to blink, to send a current to your uh, optical nerve that sends a signal to the capillaries just behind your eyelids, telling them to blink and blink and blink and blink over and over again. You didn't have anything to do with that. You're just blessed, my goodness. When your heart beats about 100,000 times a day without ever computing a single thought to your circulatory system, reminding it to continue the flow of blood through the millions of veins that are in your body that makes their way to your heart in and out, allowing it to beat over and over and over again. You didn't have anything to do with that. You're blessed. My God, when the central core of your biological framework, the brain works in harmony with 12 pairs of cranial nerves that directs 32 pairs of spinal nerves that controls over 45 miles of nerves in your body. And you never once think about walking or running or eating or lifting your arm or snapping your fingers or clapping your hands. I'm telling you, you are blessed. And if you're blessed in every now and then, you ought to be able to cry out to God and say, thank you, God, bless you, Lord. Love you, God. Need you, Lord. Want you in my life, Lord. Can't live without you. There's no way, there's no way that any of us can get through this life and world without calling and crying on God. And here in the text, the call comes in the form of this resounding cry. The psalmist cries out. Based upon his present circumstances, he cries out. And every now and then life makes you cry. It does. It does. There is no person so strong that life has not made him cry. There are no, none so faithful that life has not made her cry. History and tradition suggest that the writer of the 40th Psalm was none other than King David himself. He who was blessed to have so much, to rise so high, to be in such command was also one who knew what it was like to cry, to be patient, to know how to cry, Second Baptist is to also position yourself in becoming beneficiaries of God's amazing grace. Here we are, my family and I, in Princeton, New Jersey. I'm coming at you with the word at 25 McLean Street in, in Princeton. It is amazing what God won't do. But in the midst of our celebrating the life of Sydney's dad, 91 years young, Jay Craig, I want you to know in the midst of that crying, we are being patient and we're waiting on the Lord at the same time. You see, I believe, I just believe that God sees, God hears. God also participates in your own human activity, you see. God is not up and away, not an up and away God, described by some as esoterically evasive, existentially apart, and so eschatologically preoccupied until we can't feel or see anything from God. God is not even like the ancestors who describe he sits high and looks low. The God we serve is ever near and always here, Second Baptist Church of Evanston. 
we can bear biblical witness and we can bear world history witness to the fact that God does respond to those who are patient and those who cry out. This would be the opposite or it would be different from those who give up. Don't you ever let the record indicate that you gave up because to give up is not just a singular act of an introvert. To give up is to give up on everything that God has already ordained and bequeathed upon your life and for you to be successful. I hope someone sees it here. To give up is to not only say uh, you cannot continue, but it is to give the impression that your whole support system is a failure in your life to give up to throw in the towel, to refuse to continue whatever it is you are doing, wherever it is you're going, is to give up on everybody who has meant anything to you in life. Well, I know we don't want to hear it today. Everybody wants to go it alone today. You know, this, this world of the self-made woman, the self-made man. No one wants to be meaningfully connected to anybody else. But you didn't come into this world by yourself. You cannot leave this world by yourself. At least two people were with you at the beginning, mama and daddy. And at least one or two people will be with you at the end, the undertaker and the preacher. Giving up means that you give up on the mom who believed in you. Giving up means that you give up on the dad who worked for you. Giving up means that you give up on the sisters and brothers who were by your side as you grew up. Giving up means that you give up on the friends who played with you, the teachers who taught you, the congregation who loves you, the neighborhood that looked out for your welfare, the man or woman who won your heart, the co-worker who punched the time clock right by your side. To give up means you have given up on God, you see, who made you and sustains you and walks with you and talks with you. God who lifts you up when you fall, the God who hears you when you call. God is the one who has guided you through your most difficult moments, covered you in the time of danger. God is the one who shielded you from the storm. God has blessed you in the midnight hour, cradled you in arms of grace and mercy. God has been blessing you with the dawning of a new day from your very, very birth. If you know what God has done and what God keeps on doing, then you ought to think twice before you ever give up again. Be patient, I tell you, and cry unto the Lord. You know that God is alive today when you're patient and cry unto God. God's presence is seen in jagged peaks, standing majestically against the heightened skies. God's voice can be heard in the roaring peals of thunder during the storm and in the still silence of a sunshine-filled November afternoon. God's power can be felt in the blowing wind, the falling rain, the glowing ray of sun, the roar of ocean waves, and the wonder of our love for one another. And if we're not careful, we will forget that God's love can also be seen and felt in our tears of sorrow. God's love can be felt even when agonizing moments of despair overwhelm us and it feels like we can't go on. Now, I don't know how you feel about it today, but I, I won't give up on God. I, I can't give up on God. God is my first line of defense and my last hope that things are going to get better. I can't give up on God because God has never given up on me. And if you don't give up on God, I guarantee you, God won't give up on you. But God will not give up on you. And so please, don't you ever give up on God. Let the church say amen. At this time, brothers and sisters, we are going to extend the invitation to Christian discipleship. There may be somebody here who has not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. There may be somebody out in virtual land, wherever you are. I would say from California to New York, from Maine all the way over to Texas, wherever you are and you're listening to this word, Second Baptist Church extends the opportunity for you to come forward and to say, I yield, I yield, I can do no more. By joining us, you can do so in many ways. Call us on our phone at 847-869-6955 or visit us at our website at www.secondbaptistevanston.org. This is your moment and this is your opportunity. Won't you give us a call? We want to hear from you because we know that you are not going to give up. And now as we prepare for our benediction, we pray that all of you have had a wonderful and 
festive and a full Thanksgiving weekend. We pray that you didn't eat too much. We pray that you enjoyed yourself at the dinner table with family and friends and loved ones. We pray that you cared for yourself, that if you were in an area where you didn't know people very well or you hadn't been around them, that you wore a mask, spent as much time outside as possible, whatever that situation. But at this time, we thank God for the wonder and joy of this praise and worship service. And now unto God who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the Lord's throne. To the only wise God, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let the people of God say, keep the faith, baby. God bless you. Thank you.